Even in the midst of the PC part shortage, some people have been able to design and build some neat boards for the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4, this tiny modular computer. I've been tracking a ton of different boards powered by the CM4 on my Pi PCI Express website, and there's a link to that page in the description. Special thanks to Upswift.io, a service that helps manage Linux and IoT devices at scale. They're one of my Patreon supporters, and if you want to help me keep making these videos like Upswift does, there are links to support the channel below. But getting to today's topic, this is the Mirko PC, a full-fledged Raspberry Pi computer with a ton of features. On top is a full-size M.2 M key slot, and I made a whole video showing a Raspberry Pi booting directly off an NVMe SSD using it. You can find that video by clicking on the magic little card somewhere up here. Just above the M.2 slot is an RTC chip for keeping time and a battery backup for it, plus a fun little buzzer controlled by GPIO pin 22. How pleasant. While your ears reset from that painful experience, I'll walk through the rest of the board's I.O. Starting at the top on the right, there's a high quality 3.5 millimeter analog line out and another headphone out. The Mirko PC has a good quality DAC and amp, and I'll talk more about the sound later. Next, you have two power inputs, both rated at five volts, at least in the board revision I have. There's a standard terminal jack, which you could connect to any DC source like my bench power supply, and a USB-C power only port that can also be used to flash EMMC compute modules. Next up is a camera CSI and display DSI port, both 22 pin FFC connectors. And here's a special little trick. There are matching camera and display connectors on the back, so you can connect two cameras and two displays if you want, just like on the full size IO board. Back on the front, across the bottom, there are four USB 2.0 ports, a gigabit ethernet jack, and a single full size HDMI port. Now on the left side from the bottom, there's a second HDMI port in micro HDMI size, like on the Pi 4 Model B, then a five volt fan power socket and an activity and power LED. Across the top, there's a full 40 pin Raspberry Pi GPIO header compatible with most Pi hats, an IR receiver, and a power switch. The back side has a micro SD card slot for compute modules without EMMC, and my prototype revision of the board even has a spare pad for an EMMC chip, so you could in fact upgrade a light compute module to having EMMC. This pad might not survive in future versions of the board though, because removing it would allow the micro SD card slot to move to the edge of the board. In the current location, it's a little tricky for me to use the slot, at least if you have fingers like mine. I've used the Mirko PC a bit these past few weeks, mainly for testing various M.2 SSDs, and it performed great, though this version of the board seems to have one flaw that I hope will get worked out in the next revision. A lot of times I'd get low voltage warnings from the Pi OS when I used a faster SSD like a WD Black SN750. Some NVMe drives like this one consume a lot of power up to 10 watts and the 5 volt 3 amp rating for the power input on this board means there's only 15 watts to go around. With less power hungry SSDs, or when I didn't use an SSD at all, I didn't get the power warnings. Now, specs and features are one thing, but how well does everything work together? Well, one thing that's a little annoying about a lot of Pi-based computing, and this isn't exclusive to the Mirko PC, is that many features have to be activated in the Pi OS's configuration. For example, the high quality audio outputs require some extra configuration. In the Pi's boot config, I had to remove the line that turns on the default audio output. Then I added this configuration to enable Hi-Fi Berry for the chipset the Mirko PC uses. Once I did that, I was able to play music through mPlayer, but it's not quite the same plug and play experience you get with something like the music app on a Mac. I will say the headphone amp is quite adequate and could drive my cheap cans pretty loud, enough to be heard from across my basement. And no, I'm not kidding. Here's a clip with audio straight from the camera. Other features like the RTC also require some extra setup since the Pi defaults to using a fake hardware clock that you have to disable. First, I had to make sure the I2C interface was enabled, and I edited the boot config file again, this time adding the overlay for the PCF8523 chip in the Mirko PC. After a reboot, I could see with I2C detect that the RTC was showing up as UU, meaning the Pi's kernel module identified it. 
But the nice thing is now the Pi can keep time correctly even when it has no power just like a real computer. There are a few other features on the board I won't be covering in this video, but I wanted to stop here and mention the main reason I think this board is notable. It was conceived, built, and even well documented, better than many commercial projects I work with, by one person in Poland, Mirek. And there are two things I like about that. First, it's really amazing what one person can do in this day and age. Between the software that enables complex PCB development to the components that allow someone to put together a machine so small but so powerful, to the PCB manufacturing efficiency that allows these small runs of boards to not cost thousands of dollars anymore, it's a great time to get started in electronics. Second, this board is a great demonstration of hardware design trade-offs. Every little component that's designed into the board, like the buzzer, has to be considered carefully. Unlike the Pi 400's PCB, there's almost no wasted space on the Mirko PC. And you know what? Not everything's perfect on this board, and that's fine. The micro SD card slot is in kind of an annoying place, and I'd definitely love to have all the ports on one side if it's possible, so I asked Marek about all this, and he's actually tracking a number of revisions he might make to make it an even better little Pi PC. Just like software design, hardware design requires a lot of iteration, and it's difficult because rebuilding a piece of hardware isn't free like it is with software. It takes extra time, new boards, and more components. So, in a sense, I have even more respect for hardware designers and engineers like Marek. But I'll leave you with some wisdom from him. He said, I hope this experience can motivate other makers to create some new ideas. And hardware design is not so scary, even if you're not a big company. And on that thread, there are some other projects I'm really excited to talk about, and those will be coming up in my next CM4 board video. I'll talk about MebsT's impressive Compute Module 4 NAS, which was his first ever PCB project, and it turned out brilliant. I'll talk about the Pionora, which is raising funding on crowd supply right now, and I'll talk about this tiny router board from Seed Studios, which is the tiniest little Raspberry Pi dual gigabit router I've ever seen. All that and more is coming soon, so subscribe to the channel if you want to see it. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. Okay, now I'm actually recording after I did half of that without recording at all. I don't know why that keeps tripping me. I'll talk about the Pionora when I just realized I need to be holding something and I am not. GP, um, it's so hard to say, Raspberry Pi PGPI. Oh, if an RTC was running its own kernel, I think I'd have some trouble.